The late Roman navy, weak, degenerate, only a shadow of its former self, the once mighty fleet of the Romans that had dominated the Mediterranean, that had once defeated even mighty Carthage, hundreds of years later, in decline, in disuse, slowly falling apart. By 400 AD, incapable of defending the Mare Nostrum, the Mediterranean. Or was it? As so often with late Roman issues of any kind, the late Romans are often again portrayed as weak and degenerate descendants of mightier ancestors. We saw this same narrative with the late Roman land armies, where I hope that I could show in several videos that the late Roman army was in fact until the very end a formidable fighting force. And of course the late Roman navy shares the same fate as the late Roman land armies, in that historians often brush over it sometimes in just a few sentences, and the verdict seems all too clear, namely that the late Roman navy was only a shadow of its former self. But is this true? By now we have analyzed in thorough detail the late Roman land army. And by late I mean the late Western and early Eastern Roman land armies, so the armies of the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, in these videos here. And we found to our surprise that the often propagated narrative that the late Roman legions were degenerate and inferior to the early ones is wrong. We learned that the late Roman land army dissolved more because of the constant civil wars of the 4th and 5th centuries and because recruiting new armies had become almost impossible due to the deteriorated monetary incentives for becoming a soldier. And exactly as in the case of the late Roman land armies, the late Roman navy is also often overlooked and brushed over in just a few sentences, and of course portrayed as a weak and degenerate shadow of its former self. In order to understand that this view is wrong, we have to start in the earlier days and understand how Rome rose to power, because the rise of the Roman Empire is very much tied to the rise of the Roman navy. Rome's rise to Mediterranean superpower began with the Punic Wars. From 264 to 146 BC, Rome waged three wars against its formidable enemy, the Carthaginians, and on multiple occasions came close to the brink of destruction. In 261 BC already, the Romans built their first larger fleet of 120 ships on orders of the Senate. As this first Punic War progressed, the fleet would grow larger and larger. The loss of hundreds of ships and 100,000 men in the storm while retreating from Africa in 255 BC, one if not the largest naval disaster in human history, did not deter the Romans. Fleet after fleet was built, and in many brutal battles over the time span of a hundred years, the Romans prevailed and found themselves being transformed from a local power in Italy to masters of the Western Mediterranean. After the three Punic Wars, the Romans now commanded a very impressive navy, consisting of hundreds of warships. In the subsequent two centuries, the Greeks, Mithridates of Pontus, basically everyone that posed a threat was defeated, and by the time of Augustus, the Mediterranean had become a Roman lake, Mare Nostrum, translated as Our Sea. The only enemy that remained was Rome itself, the enemies from within and Rome fought many naval battles in the famous civil wars of the late Republic. During the conquest of Germania, Roman ships sailed as far as Denmark. The navy played again an important role during the conquest of Britannia under Emperor Claudius. During the Pax Romana, there were no enemies left of noteworthy danger and the navy was mainly used to quell some local insurgencies or as protection for grain shipments to Rome and on rivers for securing the many borders of the empire. But because for 200 years there had been peace in the Mediterranean, complacency started to set in. And if you are a Rome nerd like me and chances are pretty high that you are if you are watching this video, then you might be interested in the incredible rings and other Roman accessories which the SPQR shop is building. They make legionary rings, they make rings with different themes, they even make coin replicas, statues, pendants, attributes and terracottas. And the most incredible thing is that they handcraft every single piece. That's right, this is really high quality handcrafted material. There is really no better present for yourself or someone you know who might be a Rome fan. I put the link to their shop in the video description and into the pinned comment and with this link you can get a 10% rebate on every purchase if you type in the rebate code Majorianus.
So go and check out their sortiment, it's really quite incredible. But then the crisis of the 3rd century came and suddenly the Romans found themselves under attack from Germanic tribes, which had as so often immediately taken advantage of the constant civil wars that were raging and weakening the Imperium Romanum. But because there had been peace for 200 years in the Mediterranean, the once mighty Roman fleet had started to deteriorate. So therefore, completely new fleets had to be constructed in order to defeat these tribes, some of which had been capable of building ships of their own. In the late 260s AD, Athens, Corinth and many other coastal cities of Greece were sacked and partially destroyed by the invaders. But the Romans could defeat and drive them back in several land and naval battles. But of course, the secessions of Postumus in 260 and later Carausius in 286 and the constant civil wars further diminished the size of the Roman navy. Diocletian increased the navy again, from 46,000 to 64,000 men, and in 296 AD, in a naval landing, Britannia was restored into the Roman Empire. Now how large was the late Roman navy of the 4th century AD? Here we have to analyze the Battle of Hellespont as the only major sea battle of the 4th century which took place in 324 AD between the forces of Constantine and his rival Licinius. It was 200 ships on Constantine's side, commanded by Constantine's son Crispus, against Licinius' 350 ships, commanded by Abantus. Crispus won against all odds, mostly due to a storm that dragged most of Licinius' ships. Crispus was later executed by Constantine, talk about an ungrateful father. But these numbers are interesting because it tells us that the late Roman navy cannot have been so degenerate since these are pretty large numbers. The famous sea battle of Actium in 31 BC for instance, fought between Octavian, the later Augustus, and Mark Antony did not involve many more ships, namely 400 on Octavian's side versus 250 on Marcus Antonius's. We see these are quite similar numbers to the Battle of Hellespont and thus the later Roman Empire's navy was still quite impressive in size. Regarding the organization of the navy, it was since the time of Augustus organized in the Classis system, fleets that were stationed at certain harbors. The Classis Germanica for instance was a large fleet that operated on the river Rhine and played a crucial role in the defense of Gaul from Germanic incursions. But there were other classes and they were under control of the Praefectus classes. There were also two Praetorian fleets that, similar to the Praetorian Guard, were under direct command of the Emperor. The classes Misenensis, stationed at Misenum near Neapolis, and the classes Ravenatis, stationed at Ravenna, were the two Praetorian fleets, permanently stationed in Italy for hundreds of years with a combined size of about 110 ships. It was the very Classis Misenensis that Constantine employed, among other ships of the Western Empire, in the Battle of the Hellespont in 324 AD. After his victory over Licinius, Constantine moved the main naval base of the Roman fleet to Constantinople, thus depleting the West of much of its naval power. Here we can again see that the rise of the East was, in a manner of speaking, built upon the demise of the West and Constantine again played a big role there. It is no wonder then that the Western Roman Empire found itself without a Mediterranean navy in the later course of the 4th century. Vegetius in his late 4th century work De Re Militari already noted that the two Praetorian fleets of Italy did not exist anymore by that time. It is therefore quite likely that the Classis Ravenatis was also moved to the east together with the Classis Misenensis by Constantine. As for the units, there was of course a large variety of different ships, but in essence the ship design changed very little in the course of hundreds of years. Of course there were also many merchant ships and grain ships that carried grain shipments from Africa to Rome, but they did not count to the Roman navy. The late Roman navy consisted exclusively of warships and troop transporters. The ships employed in the 4th and 5th century would have looked similar to the early Roman ships of after the Punic Wars. The only significant change was that the ram lost its importance, so the late Roman ships normally did not have a ram as opposed to the early Roman ships of 600 years earlier. It appears that the tactic of ramming the opponent had been abandoned. <laughs>
But apart from that, these late Roman warships were of the classic row plus sail design, as in the times of the Republic, meaning that on the deck there were rowers and above deck there were sails. There were biremes, triremes, quadriremes, quintiremes, hexaremes and even larger ones are mentioned. The number stands for how the rowers were arranged. A typical trireme for example had three rowers arranged per oar, often one per rudder, but other configurations were of course also possible. The Praetorian fleets, specifically the previously mentioned Classis Misenensis, had the largest ship, which was a hexareme called the Ops. It was the flagship of the entire Roman fleet. We can imagine that it must have been quite impressive. Such ships were up to 50 meters long, sometimes they even had one or several towers on deck, acting as elevated firing platforms for archers. Their crew went into the hundreds. But even larger ships are mentioned, however, we have no exact details of what the largest ships of the Roman navy were. Decades, so tens, and even larger ones are mentioned in antiquity. For instance, Ptolemy IV apparently built a 40, so pairs of 40 rowers on each side. The ship was 130 meters long and required 4000 rowers and 400 other crew. This was the largest ship ever built in antiquity, but it was very sluggish and impractical due to its sheer size. It was more as a prestige project and for showing off, and it is unlikely that the Roman fleet had ships larger than the previously mentioned Hexareme. And even that ship size might not have existed anymore in late antiquity. Quinquiremes and Hexaremes might not have been used anymore after the 200 years of Pax Romana. The bulk of the fleets were made up of quadriremes, but even more prominently triremes. Liburnians, a type of small galley, were also used very often, and the term Liburnia was later actually used for any type of warship, not only for the small galleys. I previously mentioned the Classis Germanica on the River Rhine. This Classis was abandoned after Gallia was overrun in 407 AD by a coalition of Germanic tribes. As a consequence, Constantine III sailed from Britain to Gaul, taking with him the entire Classis Britannica, of which we don't know what happened to it later. It was probably given up or destroyed in the many civil wars of Honorius against the many usurpers of the Western Empire. But maybe remnants of the Classis Britannica might have been used by Aegidius and Suagrius as late as the 480s. A fascinating thought. We also said before that the Western Empire's Praetorian fleets were stolen, for lack of a better word, by Constantine, so that the West did not have an adequate supply of ships in order to effectively combat the Germanic invasions. It was thus that the Vandals were able to sail over to Africa from Spain in 429, which would mark a turning point for the Western Roman Empire. The Vandals themselves learned how to build ships from the local Roman population of Hispania because those locals wanted nothing more than to make the barbarians disappear from Spain and leave them in peace. The Western Romans were not able to prevent this from happening because the West was as so often entrenched in a civil war between Aetius, Flavius Felix and Bonifacius and so this disaster was allowed to happen. Subsequent tries to reclaim Africa failed, but not because the late Roman navy had become degenerate, but because the empire was under attack from all sides. A try to reconquer Africa in 440 and 441 had to be aborted. This was a joint expedition of Valentinian III and Theodosius II, because exactly at that time the Huns suddenly attacked the east and so the eastern fleet had to withdraw before the attack on the Vandals could be started. And because the east had the larger fleet since the times of Constantine, for obvious reasons, the west could not mount a naval expedition of its own. Nothing happened naval-wise in the west until, as so often in western Roman history, Majorian arrived. In part 2 of the Majorian trilogy, I will explain how he built a quite impressive fleet at several ports in Italy, and so for a few years, the Vandal raids on the coast of Italy stopped. However, Majorian's main fleet was destroyed either by traitors or in a Vandal surprise attack at Cartagena in 460 AD. 
300 ships were lost in that fateful disaster, which was a very respectable size for a supposedly weak and degenerate Western Roman Empire, a similar size as in the days of Augustus, as we saw earlier. Only 8 years later then, the Western and Eastern Roman Empire united forces in one of the largest naval operations of antiquity. A total fleet of 1,100 ships was amassed by the East and West, with the much larger part of course by the East, and at the famous disaster of Cape Bon in 468 AD, this fleet was wasted because the commander of the fleet made some terrible tactical mistakes, about which I talked in detail in this video. So we see that the late Roman Empire was quite impressive. 300 warships under Majorian and 1100 under the emperors Leo I and Antemius. Marcellinus of Dalmatia also had a fleet of about 100 ships at his disposal. This is certainly not weak and degenerate as some historians would want to make us believe. Had the operations of Majorian or Antemius and Leo I worked, the Western Roman Empire might have been restored. But alas, grave tactical mistakes were made and thus the Roman navy perished in the West for good when the Western Roman Empire dissolved. Not because of the degeneracy of the navy, but because of bad tactical decisions. But not so in the East, since the Eastern Roman navy remained a formidable fighting force for hundreds more years. But this will be the topic of another video, where we are going to analyze in detail the later Eastern Roman or Byzantine navy. And please like this video and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon or via YouTube membership, because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. And I would especially like to thank our new Sol Invictus supporter, Daniel Val, or Daniel Val. I am not sure how to pronounce it. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your amazing support. Seriously, this channel would not work without our amazing Patreon and YouTube members. And I want to thank each and everyone who is supporting this channel in any form. Gratias Tibiago Amiki. And if you are interested in learning more about the later Roman land armies, you can watch this video here in the upper right corner. But if you are more interested in learning if the late Roman soldier was inferior to the early legionary, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, gratias Tibiago and bene valete.